and thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm Lexi Renee and this is the first degree study group. We're currently on chapter three, which is personal power and how to work with the environment around you and how to use that to your advantage when working with magic. Today we're going to get, and here is a fellow friend of mine, introduce I'm Melissa. Uh, some of you might have seen me around the museum, and I am a dedicant of the Corellian tradition, studying for my first degree. So we're all in this together, and um, the whole purpose of the study group is not to, um, it's just to touch base on some things that you may have already studied, some things you are going to study, or something that you're with at the moment. And I just hope that this group keeps you informed on the basics of magic and being a Wiccan. Um, even if you're not Corellian, it's still good thing, good information to know. Today we're going to be talking about the eight holidays that are known as Sabbaths. The word Sabbath is of uncertain origin. Um, some believe that it's related to the Judeo-Christian word Sabbath, um, but there's really nothing that can put that in stone saying that it's true. Um, the first holiday that we come to is Samhain, and it's actually, it looks very much like it would be pronounced Samhain, but it's Samhain. So um, the pronunciation of some of these holidays can be a little tricky, and that's okay because, you know, if I pronounce it wrong, if you pronounce it wrong, it's all the intent behind it. And I'm pretty sure there's at least one on this list that I'm going to pronounce wrong. Um, the first holiday we come to is Samhain, which is on November 1st. And this begins the dark half of the year. Then we come to Yule, which is December 20th to 22nd, which is celebrated on the midwinter solstice, and the date varies. Var varies and that's also on the dark half of the year. In bulk, it's on February 1st, which is another dark. Ostara, which is March 20th, 22nd, is celebrated on the vernal equinox, and that date varies. Yes. Um, Nakitula says, I thought Salem was on October 31st. Um, October 31st. What's funny about Samhain, okay, it's the beginning, um, I actually have that in my notes. The reason for it being celebrated October 31st is because the celebration starts at sundown, um, and it goes on to November 1st. So it does start on the sundown of October 31st, and um, if you give me a moment, I have something on that. Samhain is celebrated on November 1st by ancient reckoning. The day begins at sundown, which is why the, the Samhain celebrations begin on October 31st. Samhain is also called Hallows or Hallowmas. The word hollow meaning spirit, literally holy one. Hi there, buddy. <laughs> we have a dog in the museum who likes to join the study groups as well. Um, where was I? Um. Beltane, which is May 1st, begins the light half of the year, and it's a very light, it's um, on the light side of the year. Midsummer, midsummer, which is June 20th to 22nd, is celebrated on the summer solstice, and that's a light. And um, there's one holiday that I cannot pronounce to save my life, so please excuse me. I'm going to butcher this. Fair warning. I usually call it just Lou, <laughs> um, and that's just the start of it. I know the teacher, I should did my homework, and I did do my homework, but no one that I could find could pronounce it either. I've seen it um, also <laughs> called Lamas. Lamas, Lamas, yes. which I just go with because it's easier. Yeah, and that's what I do. Yes. 
So we're going to continue with that, saying that it is on August 1st. And Mebun, which is September 20th to 22nd. Yes. Lu or Lu Nasad. Lu Nasad. Lu Nasad. Okay, thank you. That's that was um, Nak. Yeah. Nak. To. Uh, yeah, can you give us a pronunciation for your screen name, please? Yes. <laughs> but I usually just call it Lu. So, we're going to start with Sawin. Naticula. I think that's how it's called. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he just told me that too. We're totally butchering everything. <laughs> it's great to be here. Um, let's take a moment for a prayer. Um, Mother Goddess, please help me in pronunciation and giving me words to better run this group, to better focus us. For understanding and knowledge, Athena, give me your wisdom in this, I pray. Okay. Maybe I can calm down and actually do this right. <laughs> um, first we come to Samhain, which is the beginning of the ancient Celtic year, and is a festival of the dead. At Samhain, we honor the spirit world, the spirits of our ancestors, and our spirit guides. We can, <clears throat> we can honor those that have gone before us, our deceased and our loved ones, and it's a great time reflect, to reflect upon our own physical mortality and the nature of change and transformation in the cycle of life and death. Samhain is Gaelic. Gaelic? Gaelic? Yeah, I got it right. You got it right, oh. yeah, you did it. And means summer's end. Samhain is pronounced duh. Samhain. <laughs> That's a screw up in the notes. <laughs> um, and I've already talked about how it started on October 31st. Samhain is a lunar or grand Sabbath and is sacred to the crone goddess from whom the image of Halloween witch descends, usually depicted as an elderly woman and is a patron of magic and of the spirit world. I'm going to let you get to it. No, I'm just holding up the picture because I can see. It, it um, looks like a, a white blur. You need to get closer if you're going to show. Okay. okay. I don't need to do visual aids if you don't want, though. As someone, the psychic tide is at the high point, and it's a great time for all sorts of magic, for um, divination and inner workings. Traditionally, Wiccans consider Samhain the most sacred of all festivals. Our next holiday is Yule. Everyone loves Yule. Whether you celebrate it as Yule or Christmas, it doesn't matter. Yule's just awesome. Um, it's celebrated at the midwinter solstice, and by traditional reckoning, it marks the high point of winter. The word Yule comes from, the German, from German and means wheel. Yule separates winter and the rebirth of the sun god. As Yule is the shortest day of the year, it marks the sun's low ebb, and after this, the sun will begin to grow stronger. We just passed Yule, and now the Oak King is in power and bringing forth warmth. Though we have a little more winter to get through, we're still going to see the sun growing stronger with each day. Yule is a solar Sabbath, and is sacred to the old god, the lord of the winter. This ancient god has many names, including Kerninus, Odin, Santa Claus, and the Holly King. As the crone is the goddess of death, and the old god is the lord of death, and the spirit world and magic, he is the god of the forest, of animals, and of the hunt. In this form, he is subject of one of the oldest paintings known to exist, La Sorcerer. Uh, Galaxy Gem says, Yule was originally called Saturnalia. That's true, that's the Roman version of it. Cool. That's not in my notes. <laughs> Very good information. That's something that I did not know. Um, the next holiday, Embolc. Embolc is celebrated on February 1st. Some groups, however, celebrate it on February 2nd. So you might want to make sure of that before going to planning pagan events 
That's another one that uh, begins at sundown, right? Um, it might. Hold on. I'll be able to tell you. Oh. <laughs> In bulk, it's the festival of the beginning of spring by traditional reckoning. It represents the renewed life of earth after winter and the growing strength of the sun. In bulk, it's a festival of light and of the dawn. Because winter does not always end this early, however, the custom of the groundhog was developed as a form of sacred divination. Groundhog is released at dawn on in bulk. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out. Um, the maiden goddess has many names. Um, and this is sacred on in bulk. Yes. There's a Beatles song called Here Comes the Sun King, which would be a pretty good song for Yule. Yeah? Sun King? Yeah, Here or Comes here the Sun King. For Yule, yeah. I thought it was just Here Comes the Sun. No, that's a different song. Really? Yeah. We'll have to Oh. Okay. I'll have to look that up after this. So, uh, i got a funny Groundhog Day type story. Okay. I actually, uh, two weeks ago, met Punxsutawney Phil. Um, I went on a road trip through Pennsylvania, and they actually do have the groundhogs there in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, and they keep them in this little glass enclosure at the Punxsutawney Library in the children's room. So you can see them there, and they had two of them, and they were kind of asleep. So it must have been like Punxsutawney and his girlfriend or something. But if you drive through this town, there are giant statues of cartoon groundhogs all through the town. It's hysterical. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I actually got to meet Punxsutawney Phil. I like Groundhog Day. It's fun. I like the movie. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard some people refer to Groundhog Day as Bill Murray's Suicide Day. That's horrible. <laughs> well, have you, have you seen the movie Groundhog Day? No. He has to live the same day over and over again. He just goes, gets so sick of the cycle he tries to kill himself only to wake up. So he just keeps finding more interesting ways to kill himself. It's horrible. That's, that's such a downer. Well, the movie has a happy ending. Let's that's see. such a downer. Okay. Um, <laughs> the maiden is not only the goddess of physical fire, but also the fire of inspiration. Before I start on this, this is something that I posted on my Facebook earlier today because it really spoke to me. Um, <clears throat> and I hope you really feel the same too because um, this is actually from the Vangelo di la Strega. Um, so the maiden is not only the goddess of physical fire, but also the fire of inspiration, the fire of creativity. Hers is a fire that is the first spark of fertility in life. In the Vangelo, it says that when the goddess first beheld the beauty of the god, she trembled. And her trembling was the first dawn. That is why dawn is thought of as a goddess. And that the quality of inspiration and desire for beauty is the nature of the maiden goddess. What is the difference between Imbolc and Beltane? Um... Beltane is celebrated on May 1st, and it's the beginning of the light half of the year. And um, it's the beginning of summer, summer while um, in bulk is the festival of the beginning of spring. Um, in bulk is really for the maiden. Beltane is the union of the goddess and god. Does that answer it well enough? I like Galaxy Gem say that, but sounds good to me. Yeah, Galaxy Gem says thanks. Our next holiday is Ostara. Ostara is celebrated at the spring equinox, along with Easter, as most, the majority of people know it. When day and night are equal at this time, it is considered the high point of the spring season when life is bursting forward in all directions. Like in bulk, Ostara is a festival of the dawn and of increasing life. Ostara comes from the Germanic word, Ost or East, a reference to the dawn and the renewal of life. The rituals of Ostara celebrate renewed life in many forms, eggs, a symbol of rebirth, are painted in bright colors and used in sacred rites before being eaten. Baby animals, especially chickens, ducks, rabbits, are symbolic of the season. A rabbit, ancient symbol of the moon, represents the earth's 
renewed fertility. I'll talk about rabbits in a moment. Ustar is a solar Sabbath and is sacred to the young god, the lord of the rising sun and of life. This god has many names, but he is particularly venerated as a green man, in which form he is shown surrounded by greenery and breathing it out from his lips. Ustara also has a strong feminine connotations, as it is sacred to the maiden goddess, as well as the young god. Ustara and Istori are both Germanic names of the maiden goddess, as Lady of the Dawn. Um, when I talk about Freya, I, or when you see me calling down the goddess, I usually use the term Lady of the Dawn. Because, as I said with Imbol, um, that the dawn is thought of as a goddess, and that's something that I relate to. Um, you've probably seen me in ritual yeah. call down the goddess as Lady of the Dawn. Um, just because I'm in my maiden period of life, yeah. and I don't know. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, the rabbit was actually my totem <laughs> for a while. Really? Um, and it came from an S.J. Tucker song, um, that said the rabbit was the king of the beast. Which sounds really weird, but it was believed that the rabbit was the only creature that could talk to the heart of the man without installing fear. So, you know, um, it looked funny. You know, you, no one suspects the rabbit. <laughs> oh. um, rabbits were also um, used for a certain kind of um, Augury, where you, you let the rabbit uh, let a rabbit go, and depending on which direction um, it ran, uh, that was um, sort of the answer to the question. And the most famous um, people who sort of was was marked down as doing this was uh, Boudica, who was the queen of the Iceni, Iceni who uh, led her people against the Romans. Nice. And I know we're going through a lot of information, so you might have to watch this again to catch it all, but. Um, I wasn't really sure how to shorten this, um, just because it's so much good information about the holidays. And um, our next is Beltane. Beltane is celebrated on May 1st, and it's the beginning of the light half of the year, and the beginning of summer by traditional reckoning. Beltane is the polar opposite of Samhain, and is the festival of life. Um, <clears throat> Beltane celebrates the union of goddess and god and is celebrated with great joy. Beltane is a lunar or grand sabbat and is sacred to the great mother goddess. She is a lady of life who brings fertility to the earth and at this time her power is on the rise as earth brings forth an abundance of life. The mother goddess is the principal archetype, archetype of the goddess. Um, Beltane is really important. Um, because it's life, and that's where the great right comes in. And um, you have several, I believe, is not Beltane the time for the maple as well? Um, I or is so, that yes. midsummer? Uh, Beltane no. is Beltane the maple. Yeah, I thought so. Is the maple. And um, that's another symbolism of the great right. Another ritual you'll find is the chalice and the athamane. Everybody in the chat says yes to. <laughs> Just so they know. Okay. The chalice and the athame being united is another ritual that can be performed. Perform. So our next is midsummer, and as its name implies, it is celebrated at the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. Midsummer is considered the high point of the summer season. That's cute. <laughs> you know, Ed never brought back my Mountain Dew. Sorry. Rabbit. Yeah, it's her Mountain Dew. Yes. It's her Mountain Dew. <laughs> is it Midsummer also called Litha? Yes. yes. Yes, it is, and I was about to get to that. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's somewhere in here. <laughs> um, Midsummer, yes, Midsummer is called Litha. I remember that. Um, I've heard that there aren't terribly many references to the name Litha used, and one of the easiest ones to find is uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy. Oh, nice. Um, the Hobbits celebrate Litha. Yeah. And some people actually might think that's think that's might be where the name came from. 
instead of an actual historical source. Hmm. I will have to check on that. I will. Um, this celebrates the very height of the powers of the sun and of life. But it also acknowledges that after this date, the sun will begin to weaken and the days to grow shorter. A solar Sabbath, midsummer, is sacred to the sun god as lord of life. This god has many names, including Apollo, Lu, Horus, Chengo, and many others. Chengo, I think? Oh well. He is the god of life in the physical world, and is the principal archetype of the god. The celebrations of midsummer stress the powers of light and life and rejoice in the good things the universe has to offer. Midsummer is also known as Litha. So yes. Um, so we're going to talk about Lu, and I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> um, it's celebrated on August 1st, though a few groups may celebrate it on August 2nd. The name... Um, means marriage of Lu. Lu is the Celtic god of the sun and also of vegetation and the cultivated fields. The marriage of Lu is the harvest, when the crops are reaped, when the harvest is completed and the last of the crops has been cut. Lu is symbolically married to the crone goddess of the dead, but Lu marks the beginning, not the end of the harvest. It is the beginning of the autumn or fall season by traditional reckoning. Lu is a festival of first fruits when thanks are given for the fertility of the fields and the first bread broken from new harvest is blessed. Um, she who provides the bounty of the earth and her thanks are given in this form as lady of life that the goddess is portrayed in the famous Venus of Willendorf, Willendorf um, statue. Some 300,000 years old, the Venus of Willendorf shows the mother goddess pregnant, her bosoms heavy with milk, a testament to the fertility and life-giving qualities of the great mother. Lu is also called Lamas, first fruits and first fruits. Our last um, holiday that Wiccans follow is Mayboon. And it's celebrated on the fall equinox, when day and night are again equal. Mayboon is the middle of the harvest of the fall season. The name Mayboon comes from the Celtic god Mabon, or Maybonus, who died every year to be reborn in the spring. Mabon is permanent. Uh, duh. Um. Scroll. Up. Okay. Mayboon is a solar Sabbath, and it's sacred to the Father God. This is the God as king and judge, lord of the tribe and elder of the community. He is lord of balance, law, and justice, the God of honor. Mayboon is also sometimes associated with the old God, especially in his form of, of Dionysus, because this is a great time of the grape harvest, a great time to have mead. Not that I know, but... Great time to have meat for you. <laughs> In addition to lunar and solar Sabbaths, Wiccans also celebrate Esbats. That's pronounced right, right? What? Esbats. Yeah. Yeah. Sabbaths are the big ceremonies that we have, and it tend to be about celebrating and attuning to the season and honoring deity. Where um, Esbats are little ceremonies. They can be to honor deity, but are much more personal. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, groups tend to be more individual in their workings and geared towards personal goals and growth of their members rather than cosmic phenomena. Traditionally, thank you, doggy. Um, traditionally, esbats are held on nights of the new moon and full moon. A new moon as that takes place at every beginning of the moon cycle, the start of the light half of the month. At new moon, one works to manifest things which will grow along with the moon as it waxes. The full moon takes place at the very end of the light half of the month when the moon is at the strongest point in its cycle and the energy of the monthly cycles is as the strongest. Okay. 
Um, okay, the psychic tide also rises and falls each year, reaching its highest point at Samhain and Beltane. Winter is the dark or internal half. Summer, the light or external half of each year. Following so far? I know, it's a lot. Um, by knowing and understanding the psychic tide, you can attune to it and really take advantage of its points of high energy. So let's go back um, to when we first start talking about psychic, um, the psychic tide and personal power is using color, using vortexes to your advantage um, and really moving with this energy to really get everything flowing perfectly. I personally don't usually look at the moon for um, working with, but I do look at vortexes and it's just something more you can add to your magic. Um, you know, the environment that you're practicing has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. How clean is the space that you're working? How comfortable are you with it? So all of these things and the time of the year really can add up to producing the best ritual or the best effect. For me, as a bit of a kitchen witch, I can never do any, any, any magic in my kitchen until all of the dishes are done. That's yeah. my rule. You've got to sort of prepare the space by cleaning it up. And in cleaning it up, I sort of take the time to bless it. Yeah. How does one look at vortices? Um, vortexes. Vortexes are energy cin um, centers. It's where many ley lines, and ley lines are like veins of the earth, interconnect. And at these crossroads, um, you can find these, you can learn to feel them more and more. But it's basically a point. Now, vortexes can be made over a period of time, or they can be made artific artificially. There are several natural vortexes. Um, large cities are usually on large vortexes, or a place that a lot of wildlife seems to pass through, because we're naturally attuned to vortexes and ley lines. Um, that's a whole other thing, but I love vortexes. Um, you can also make artificial vortexes. Yes? What does a vortex feel like? Um, that depends on the energy around it. Some vortexes, okay, say that you're raised in an abusive home or people that are not very happy tend to congregate in a house. You'll notice if you invite guests over that they can be sensitive to this energy and feel unwelcomed. But you can also do the reverse effect of that, meaning that you can put, put positive energy in a home or in a place as we're in the temple room here to make people want to come here, want to enjoy and honor deity. You can really attune a place to feel the energy when it passes through a room to feel a certain way. And that's a lot of the idea of feng shui, right? Yeah. It's creating a positive flow of the right kind yes. of energy. Yes. You said large cities lie on large vortexes. Do these different vortexes have different types of energies? Um, of course, um, wherever you have a congregation, you're going to have energy different depending on what's there. Um, everything has its unique energy signature. So um, a whole, let me take the spirit of Salem, for instance. I have my own energy, you have your own energy, but all congregated, we make the, a whole, the spirit of Salem as a whole. So when you're bringing a new energy to this place, or old energy is being taken out of this place, it does change the overall signature of an area or a vortex. Um, let me give you a definition of vortex. While you're looking that up, I actually have an example of okay. the, the, the shift from city to city. Um, it was sort of an exercise when I was traveling Italy um, a couple months ago. Um, I really tried to familiarize myself with the energy and the, the spirits of each city that I went to. Uh, tried to get to know it, sort of introduce myself to it. And um, when I went to Venice, it was a very strong, concrete sense 
of a spirit. In many ways, I thought it was familiar because it was much like the spirit of Salem that was just full of mischief and excitement and a love of festivities. And then you go to Florence, and there was just a totally different feel in that city, something a little, little more um, solemn. And then Rome was crazy, because on Rome, it was like you had a different personality on every single block. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that city, and being that that's a city that has seen so much, gone from being a pagan center to having the Vatican on its outskirts, and all of that, I think it really made sense that the city had pantheons walking around it. There were many vortexes in that city. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And here's the definition. Vortices are the energy centers or chakras of the earth. The earth's energy is stronger and more easily interacted without a vortex, just as our own energy is stronger and more easily interacted with, <coughs> with at our own chakra points. Vortices are ideal spots to receive energy from the earth and to send, send healing to the earth. For this reason, vortex points are usually considered sacred spots and are often used as worship centers. Just as the chakras of the body are connected by meridians that transmit energy between them, so too the earth's vortices are connected by ley lines. Now, the the crystal web project mm -hmm. the purpose of that to be make could you i mean could you say that you're essentially when you make a crystal access point you're making a small vortice yes and you're okay. creating an access point to a huge man artificially made um system of ley lines system of ley lines that is um us making it's the belief that a stone held in my hand can connect to a stone that's held in your hand by ley lines um, or meridians to these points. Um, and it's really tapping this one, which will allow me to tap yours. Um, that's getting more into the energy work side of it. But vortexes can be made artificially or naturally. And as witches, we should strive to make our own homes a positive center of magic. Um, you'll find, actually, that's a great point. You'll find when you set up your own altar, you start doing magic that you're making a vortex, that the more you cast a circle in the same spot, you'll find the energy build up, and you'll find more s that you feel safe in that spot, and that it becomes your own personal vortex. Are there any exercises you could think of that might you know, help us practice sensing vortexes and noticing them? Um, the best way is because in sensing vorte vortices, um, that's receiving information. So chakra work, um, work with your third eye and just opening up the chakras as in lessons really brings you. The second degree gets more into how to construct um, artificial vortices. That You get more into that in the second degree, but the first degree really lets you start sensing it. Okay. Um, what I used to do, and this is separate from the first degree. <coughs> okay. Um, is close my eyes and just reach out and ask the earth to show you. But, um, point being, we're going to get back where I was and, um, for the god of the month. The god of the month is the maiden. The triple goddess has three aspects, the mother, the maiden, the crone. And this, for this lesson, we're going to go on the maiden. The maiden is the aspect of the triple goddess in her youthful form. Sometimes the maiden is conceived of as a child, but more often as an independent young woman. The maiden is the goddess of beginnings, growth, and expansion. She is symbolized by the waxing moon. The maiden rules over the dawn, the season of spring, and the direction of the east. The maiden is the goddess of passion and creativity. The maiden goddess tends to be shown in one of three main forms. The artist, goddess of all arts and crafts, skills and sciences, like I believe Athena would mm -hmm. be an example. The guardian, the goddess as warrior and protector. I see that as Freya. Um, eh, give or take. Um, because the next is the lover, the goddess of love, beauty, and sexuality. And I, I see Frey in all three of those, personally. Um, 
though these three forms may seem contradictory, they're in fact not. Rather, they each represent a different focus on the maiden's energy of creativity and self-expression. Um, <clears throat> so, um, below are several examples of the maiden goddess, and you can look these up on your own time. I don't really have um, time to go through at them, but here are some examples of maiden goddesses. Athena, Bridget, Hathor, and Vesta, which is a Roman goddess. And those are some examples of the Maiden. And you can check out the Maiden and more on the Maiden. Um, but I hope that was a great review of Sabbaths. And if there's any questions, um, now would be the time for them. I've ran over a little bit on what I was supposed to do. But um, that was a lot of information to cover. You'll probably have to go back over this. I hope everyone's having a great time with their first degree studies and um, continue watching and I believe that you had something on Sabbaths as well. Uh, yeah, I've sort of been working on <coughs> a project as I go through this chapter and that is a children's coloring book about the Sabbaths and, and basically it's uh, things that I've written explaining the Sabbaths, sort of simplifying them. Uh, for children, accompanied by uh, Reverend Don Lewis's artwork. And if you want, I can hold up some of the pictures. As this is my... Alright, so we've got Salon, Yule. And this has really been an interesting challenging, challenge for me as I'm studying these, to, to just learn how to, to sort of cut them down to two or three sentences, and just kind of get to the heart of them. And this coloring book should actually be up within a few days on um, our eBay site and some of our other stores, if any of you are interested. It is for children, but also people with a very strong sense of inner child. Both of these. Um, so, yeah. And all of this is original artwork but done by Reverend Don Lewis himself. And if you have kids or know anyone who have kids and they're trying to raise them in a very pagan or Wiccan environment, this is a great opportunity to just be very subtle with it. Um, because, you know, I don't agree with trying to force religion down kids' throats, but it's always good to educate them. And that's really what these are meant to do. And Melissa has done a very fine job on the description so kids are able to understand and to actually enjoy our heritage. Paul Michael says they would also be a great addition to a Book of Shadows. This they is very are. true. This um, is very true. We do have Book of Shadow pages. And I am currently working on Deviant Art putting all of Reverend Don Lewis's original artwork up for the public, and we have wonderful work. I mean, the man is a great artist, um, and also a great spiritual leader, and I'm sure everyone's already familiar, but um, it's just, some of his work's just mind-blowing. I've been going through his art, and it's just so powerful. It really is. Um, so check us out. Um, Keep looking us up on eBay for more art, artwork. Artwork. We're getting things on Etsy. We're also going on DeviantArt. And on WitchSchool.com, we actually have a Book of Shadows pages on one of the top tabs. So you can easily check it out there as well. Or get in touch with the museum. There's plenty of ways to get this information. And all of the artwork. We also have spells that are written by Reverend Don Lewis himself. Um, that are great additions to Book of Shadows. But um, I think that wraps it up. And I want to thank everyone for joining me this evening. Thank you for your support. I could not do this without you. And, you know, without... Comment, like, post videos. And if you would, comment on Facebook. Tell people about our study groups. That's the only way I can continue doing this. Um, the only way that this can continue forward is if people actually start watching 
and start participating. So feel free to email me, um, get a, and a hold of me, and I'm going to put that in the chat room very soon. Um, comment, like us on Facebook, and do whatever you need to do to help us go forward and share this information. And I just want to thank you all and um, for your continued support and see you next Sunday. Many blessings. <laughs> and we get the Sun King playing. That's funny. Which tab? Um,